We're joined by Chikode Ukowe, who's the founder of Salad Africa, and we'll be exploring the role of credit in Nigeria's economic growth and um, provide a lot of insights on accessing credit as an entrepreneur because it's so, so tough for the Nigerian business landscape. Look at what is happening with interest rate 27.25. How many Nigerians can walk into the banking hall, get access to credit at 27.25? No bank, as a matter of fact, is going to give you a debt. Banks are pegging it above the um, interest rate. The NPR is 27.25. So obviously, banks are pegging their interest, their interest rates at, at, along the 30% mark, 35% mark. How many business persons in this country walk into the banking hall, get access to loans, and put it in this business, make profit, and still be able to meet up with debt obligation of more than 35%? That is a crucial conversation we need to have in the Nigerian business landscape. And I have Chikode Ukawe. You're very much welcome to the business. Uh, it's Thanks. good to have you. Good to What's your take about what has been happening in the Nigerian business landscape? It's so, so tough. Um, businesses are struggling to survive. Interest rates going up the roof. The CBM governor saying his sole reason for increasing the interest rate that high was to tame inflation. And we are, we, we are stalled on economic growth. What do we, Let's talk. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for bringing on the show. Yeah. Um, I think everything basically stems from economic factors, right? Yeah. Um, I think recently World Bank um, issued a warning, Very you know, to Nigerian banks that we had passed the threshold of uh, five NPLs. Yeah. Percent NPL. Um, but then when you take a look at the cosines, right? Um, I think in a 2008, 2018 report, yeah. about ninety nine percent. About one percent of um, of credit went to SMEs. Just one percent. One percent. Yeah. In two thousand and eighteen, uh, two thousand eighteen report. So where did the rest of it go? Right. Um, I think Ganifa and me some time ago was all, was all, you know, talking about how um, you know Amcon had to basically buy loans from the rich. You know. Um, so we have to take a look at the, the macro, the macro conditions, Very which is that why are people not paying back their loans? First of all, where did the loans go to and why are people not paying back their loans? Uh, you have high inflation, um, you know, and let's say people collected money at a, particular, um, at a particular amount or a particular time, what they wanted to use it for, the value at, a, at, at more or less eroded. Yeah. So MPLs are just going to be a cause of, of economic factors. And that's why, you know, the CBN themselves are also trying as much as possible while trying to curb inflation, which one of the things is actually to raise MPR. Yeah. And has a cost, a causative effect on um, on lending rates. Very true. So, what can be done? Um, I think one of the things is that we are going to see banks giving less loan. Yeah. Right, because um, capital 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 um, cushions, uh, capital buffers have been have been eroded. Right. So, the risk appetite to be able to give new loans is going to reduce. Um, so, for the SMEs and for the businesses. Um, one, they can always look for alternative forms of funding. What are the alternative sources of funding? Because uh, we always hear that, but it looks like there is no alternative source of funding. Tell us. Let's have a conversation around that. Yeah. They go walk into the banking halls. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to get access to credit from the bank. Yes. Banks are not forthgiving. Yes. They're not giving them, them the monies. And you, you, you're talking about alternative access, getting access yeah. from alternative means. Can, mm -hmm. can you share some of these alternative means that... As MSMEs can go because these MSMEs are the backbone of the Nigerian economy. Mm -hmm. The Nigerian economy is not being run by Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. listed on the NGX. No, mm -hmm. they are being run by MSMEs. Mm -hmm. These guys are create the largest employment. An average Nigerian mm -hmm. is self employed. Mm -hmm. Where do these guys walk into? Where do they go to get access to credit? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. So there's a long term solution, there's a short term solution, right? Um, the long term solution is that banks. Right? They are so purpose. The reason why banks were created, right? if you take a look at the history of banking, the creation, the banks were created to, to create liquidity in the market. That's their job, yeah. right? to ensure that people are able to deposit their money and people are able to take those monies and use it to trade. Right? Economic development. That's the purpose of a bank. A bank is not where you go and hide your money. Yeah. Right? It is their purpose to create liquidity in the market. So long term is that banks need to be able to give credit. It is, there, there is no utopia in which we find a way around banks giving credit. Yeah. So we have to be able to fix that. Why are banks unable to give credit today? Fundamentally, it's our credit infrastructure. Right? Our credit infrastructure is what informs our banks 
two things about a person or about a business, which is this person's capacity to pay back and this person's willingness to pay back. That is usually summed up in a number called a credit score. Okay. Right? A credit score is where different data points are aggregated, right, based on somebody's lending behavior. Right? But it's difficult to aggregate somebody's lending behavior when the person has never lent before, which is why we are chatting about financial inclusion. Sure. I can't make a profile about you if I don't even know who you are. Well, we're talking about identity, identity management. Yeah. Right? So there's different layers, both from the private and public sector, that needs to be done for us to build our credit infrastructure. Now, this current administration has done something intelligent. For instance, if you Google or you ask ChatGPT, how do you solve Nigeria's credit problem? They say, it would possibly tell you a five-point agenda. Yeah. One of which is to strengthen, to unify our credit infrastructure, our credit scoring um, system. Right? Number five will somewhere be around um, education. Because we are in an environment where predominantly borrowing is seen as bad. Very true, very right? true. So it's typically a five-point agenda. And this current administration has created something called the Credit Corp, Nigerian Credit Corporation, um, where their, their mandate, the two points in their mandate is number one, um, to basically, um, OK, so they have a three-point mandate. First one is to unify the credit scoring system. All right. So let's find a way to identify people, give them credit scores, which gives lenders more um, confidence to be able to lend. Number two is to make. Um, not cheap, but more affordable capital, affordable to the people, I mean, um, open to the people who want to actually lend to the end user. Oh, yeah. And then the third one is education. So that's their three points agenda that needs to be done. In the meantime, what do we need to do? We need to innovate. Um, but that's what you're doing. Yes. I, I, I love the idea of, of innovating. Yes. It's also very tough in subterrain because you talked about education. Yes. You run a, a, a new bank. I love, love to put it that way. And that's, that, that's why we're, we're having this conversation. Mm -hmm. Why is it difficult for, okay, so for instance, you want to give access, um, credit to, to, to a business person. Mm -hmm. They walk into your facility, Salad, mm -hmm. and they ask for loan. And what would you be looking out for mm -hmm. from the MSME mm -hmm. that will make you give them money? Mm -hmm. And that what would you not be looking out for that will make you not give them money? Mm -hmm. What would qualify them? What wouldn't qualify them? So entrepreneurs understand what they need to work on, what yeah. they need to do to be able to get access to credit, because that's the fundamental. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so first of all, what Salad does is we're a technology infrastructure company. We're not a bank, okay. right? Um, and rightly so, because we have very, very good banks. If you Google top five banks in Africa, about one or two Nigerian banks will be there. So the problem is not the banks themselves. They are very competent, some of the most competent people that you'll meet in Africa. The problem is the infrastructure in this area, yeah. right? And that is one of the things that we are looking to do, OK? What Salah does is that we meet SMEs, right, at the point where they can be, where they are, they are most, they can be easily qualified. So you have SMEs on one side who are very competent people, doing very remarkable things, backbone of the economy, yeah. largest employer of labor. On the other side, you have some of the most competent people in the banking industry who are pretty liquid. So why can't they transact? It's because this person is unable to qualify this person. Very simply put. Why is this person not qualified? Because you need, you, need, you, need, you need credit data. You need credit data. You need to be able to tell the capacity to pay back and the willingness to pay back. One of them is tangible, which is, look, I can tell your capacity to pay back, which is I can take your bank statements, I can see that, okay, if I borrow you money, you're going to pay back. But the willingness... How do you now draw the willingness? Okay, good. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things that we do is that for... SMEs who SMEs are unable to get loans from banks, but then they are using other they are using platforms, you know, they are Very using true. digital platforms to conduct their businesses. Yeah. We go to those digital platforms, right? And we assess the credit worthiness of these people through their behavior on those. Some, some of them are even non-banking platforms. I have a you have I have a farmer who consistently supplies two million a week worth of maize. Right? Yeah. But he's unable to walk into a bank to go and get credit. I go into that platform and I say, look, you know what? This particular guy, can I see his transaction history? Two, two weeks, every, every, two, every week he's doing two million now. Okay? I aggregate that data. And then I've already integrated with banks who already have the capital yeah. and have very robust risk scoring and risk management systems. And I say, this is this person. This is all the information from, um, of this person from this platform. 
this is why I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this person actually deserves a loan. Yeah. The bank then takes that information, digests it, and transacts with that person within that ecosystem that the person already transacts. And most times, we are also able to collect repayment directly from those digital platforms. Oh. So we are able to, one, do the qualification for capacity to pay back, and number two, we solve the willingness to pay back because we are able to deduct directly from source. So this is the, the, the job that Salah does, more like interpretation. You have competent what? banks on the right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I understand that aspect. Let, let, let's pivot a little bit. Let, let's go into policies. What policy do you think the government can do right now to be able to improve our credit system in this country? Because policies have a long way to go. It's from macro level. Mm -hmm. And that would definitely have a double down effect on everyone. Yeah. So what policies? Let's see, you're, you're a private player, um, and there's only limits to how much you can have access to any yeah. market. There's only a limit to the influence you can have on the country in general. Yeah. But when we want to talk about policies, it's, it's a broader um, yeah. um, perspective. What, yeah. what policy would you recommend? Fantastic. Okay, so there are stuff that the government has started, yeah. and they're doing very well. And then there's some other things that need to happen. So I'll start with the ones that the government has done very well. Um, I think our oldest credit bureau, I think, launched maybe 2008, right? Compared to America, who's launched in 1899. So <laughs> you, you can kind of see the difference. Yeah. However, there's been like a, um, an enable, enablement for that sector. All right. In 2017, um, the central bank um, insisted that commercial banks and other financial institutions use something called the CRMS, which is the Credit Reporting Management System. Right? There was a Credit um, Act that was done, whereby these commercial banks are now mandated to report lending transactions into that CRMS. So if you're an access bank and somebody comes to borrow money from you, I can check the CRMS and see that this person has borrowed money before from Zenith Bank, and this is the behavior. Right? So there's a, so there's a, there's a CRMS um, that the central bank actually um, revised the act in 2017. So you can see that there's some, some, some things going on there. Um, secondly, like I said, this, this current administration has seen that credit data is distributed. You have about maybe three or four prominent um, credit scoring um, agencies. You have your CRC, you have the rest, right? One of the things that um, Credit Core is trying to do is unify our credit system such that we have everybody's, everybody's um, information in one place. But, but, but what, would we, what, what, would, what do you have to say about BVN? BVN have been able to... Thank you. There's there so many data points that. in this country. We have BVN, we have, um, um, what is it called, NIMC, mm -hmm. your, your, your NIN, so many data points. You yeah. go to this agency, they're mm -hmm. asking for the same data, mm -hmm. like your BVN. So there's no unification of data. What, what's, what's the work of BVN? Fantastic. So BVN is, a, is an identifier, yeah. right? BVN itself is not particularly a, the risking uh, data point. It just tells you who you are, and which is the second thing I was going to mention. Yeah. Um, what the CBN is doing is good, trying to unify credit data, but the thing that the government needs to actually also help with is identification management, which I mentioned before. Um, it didn't exist. Well, it wasn't as strong before, and that's why the banks took it upon themselves to implement BVN. Right. Um, when you go to America, you have a social security number, which is your unified number. Sure. Um, the government has now tried to also implement that with the NIN. So identity is important as a unifier to unlock your credit data. Your credit data exists, but how do I identify you as a person? Which is what the government is trying to now you know, clamp down on with um, NIN. Yeah. If I have your NIN, right, the truth is that your BVM becomes obsolete. Because if I can use your NIN as a unique identifier, yeah. your name is Frank. Right. Well, how many Franks are there? <laughs> 60 million. You know what I'm saying? You need, you need, you need an, a unique identifier for me Very to true. go to credit bureau, put that number in, and then it gives me your credit history. That is what the NIN is actually supposed to be. But before that, the banks um, took initiative upon themselves to create um, the bank verification number. What's the outlook of, in the next five years, what, where do you see our credit system in the next five years? What's your take? Um... In the next five years, I mean, I'll be very candid with you. Um, I don't see... So let me talk about the infrastructure part, which, I, again, All right. anything I'm, I mentioned in the, on this show, the infrastructure is the, is the key to unlock. Okay. On the infrastructure point of view, I see that there will be improvements with the work that this current administration has seen that needs to be done on the credit side of things. Um, I see some enablements in credit reporting. I see more collaborations like ourselves and banks. 
um, coming together to aggregate um, aggregate um, data points. Um, apart from the conventional data points that are used to de-risk people, just like in the U.S., even though they started credit reporting in the 18, 1800s, right? They just in just I think 2005, they just started accepting alternative data, like your social media behavior, like do you pay your rent on time? You know, these are behavioral things that can use to assess you. So just that just happened in 2005 in America. So I see that over the next five years, our credit our credit infrastructure will be bolstered. We'll start being more open-minded to alternative data, yeah. and we'll see more credit, right, being unlocked through partnerships with banks and fintechs. Very, are, very are, important. Are you looking at the informal sector? Of course. The, because the informal sector is one sector that has been left alone. And these guys, they've been able to come together mm -hmm. to build their own infrastructure. Yes. Door, termed informal. We have Ajor. We have um, contribute. They, they, they have, they, they have um, what is it called? They have another, they have different contributory um, system where they used to finance, finance themselves. Yeah. Locally made, but still functional. And with all the technology we're having, it looks like none of this tech has been able to beat their, their traditional system of, of financing. Fantastic. So fintech technology is not an alternative to traditional finance. Oh, wow. School of speed. Right. It's not an alternative. <laughs> all right. Um, I still posted something to my team. Technology is meant to improve the way we do things. Okay. And you see that in kind of your innovations that are coming, coming up these days. More and more product people, more and more technology people are beginning to build for the informal sector. Fella said something. Fella said, technology is technology. <laughs> yeah. In Yoruba, that means you press it for light to go and wake it up. True. Oh, yeah, true, true, true. You cannot improve what you don't know. The term informal means they are operating outside of what is considered formal. So the very first thing we need to do is that we need to put light. What, we can't improve what we don't know. And that's one of the, 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 the beautiful things that fintech is doing, right? Banks are on this side. And fintechs are nimble enough to go into the market and say, look, how are you guys saving money? Let us help you digitize it. And it's not that we go into the market and say, we're going to build you a mobile app, <laughs> right? How are you guys communicating? Mobile phones. What can we do via text message, right? When you are able to build for this segment, right, then they stop being informal. They now come into the digital ecosystem. Once they're in the digital ecosystem, they can be included. And this is the whole drive for financial inclusion. Go into where formal financial services have been unable to reach, right? Not because of any fault of theirs, but because they are big, right. right? You who are nimble, go into those places. Find out how they are doing what they are doing and digitize. For instance, like I said, uh, we are partnered with a particular technology platform who works with smallholder farmers. They help them to connect them to two people. One is the end user, so from farm to home, right? And the second is to large corporates who buy in bulk for export, right? Because of technology, they are able to aggregate these guys into the same place, aggregate them into a warehouse, right? Pay them through financing, which is one of the things that we connect them to. Pay them through financing. Let them live quality lives. Take those goods, transport it into the... And most of these, these transactions are financed by banks. But if the work that Salad... If Salad didn't do the work they were doing, that transaction would be absolutely absent very to true. the bank. Right? So fintechs have a very large part to play in the next five years to go into where is most needed and build for those use cases, as opposed to building what has worked in more developed markets. We need to build for this market. And once we are digitized, then we can empower. A lot of um, um, Nigerians are of the fact that the fintech wave is so, is, 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 is so high. And what do I mean by that? There are so many fintech companies springing out every blessed day. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's only the financial sector that there are problems in. I don't know problems in, in um, agri agriculture. I don't know problems in, 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 in manufacturing. I we have Dime it doesn't problem. Transportation is there. Um, um, they, we need technology for even governance. So there are problems everywhere. But it looks like it's only the fintech sector, and that that particular part of, of, of the tech ecosystem is literally the um, um, the anchor at which we have foreign direct investment coming into this country. Can't it be decentralized? Mm -hmm. I want to use the crypto word now. <laughs> Let's decentralize this innovation to other sectors. Okay. What's your take about that? 
Fantastic. Uh, first of all, I, I, I do know that there is some, I won't call it desacralization, but there's some attention paid into other sectors. But you are very right. FinTech is the bulk of it. And I'm going to pose the question to you. You mentioned our grid transportation and manufacturing. Can any of that exist without finance? None of them. Can any of them exist without payments? None of them. Exactly. Not even NGOs. Exactly. <laughs> so when they refer to FinTech, we talk about the foundation, the rails, right? Rails. You know, rails are used as a term because in the Industrial Revolution, what changed it for yeah. the world was trains. Yeah, true. But before there were trains, you had to lay the tracks. It's the same thing here. Before the economy can move, before transportation can grow, before manufacturing can go, you need rails, and those rails are financed, right? And that's why there's a lot of attention. Nigeria is still, is still considered a developing market, right? And in the developing market, you work on the foundation. And most of the foundation is on, you know, finance. Um, yes, we have some segments that may look like they are overflowed, but that's because they've still not been solved, right? We're looking at different ways to solve the payments issue, different ways to solve the credit issue. It looks like you have like 1,000 loan apps, but still only 1% of SMEs um, are being included in the formal and financial sector. Yeah. So the reason why it looks like uh, FinTech is getting most of the attention is because um, for economic development, for the rest of them to be able to grow and scale, we need to get fintech. We need to get uh, financial services right. If you cannot collect money, if you cannot pay money, if you cannot borrow money, um, a lot of the other industries will be stifled. Fikodi Bukare, honestly, very big thank you for coming to the business. Uh, by the way, when are you guys going to list on the NGX? When are, <laughs> when, when we're not seeing fintechs on the NGX. We're not seeing a lot of uh, many of these startups. They become even unicorns. They're yes. not listing in our markets. What is happening? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so maybe we'll talk about this another time. But, but um, startups, yeah. by nature, are not small businesses. I think it's very important to know the difference. Um, technology has the potential to scale, right? And that is what investors invest in, that potential to scale. Um, if you are doing, two, if you are, you are doubling your revenue every year. As a, as a business, you are doing very okay. But as a startup, you are failing because technology is supposed to be able to scale you 10x, 50x. And that is what foreign investors are betting on, right? And that is basically why, um, you know, most of, the, uh, most of the liquidity events that we are seeing are that they list outside in a more open market or, you know, they get acquired by a larger company, right? Um, we will see more companies list on the um, Nigerian Stock Exchange, I think, um, when, just like I said, we now start building for our own use case. A startup launches today, and in three months, they, they, they say they are expanding to Kenya and Uganda. You've not solved your Lagos audience. What are you going to go and do outside? Right? But then you need to scale. Um, but then a lot of startups, particularly like ourselves as well, are beginning to see that, look, we're looking to, well, first of all, we want to solve the Nigerian problem. Right? Um, and we are very well placed by being an integral part of how established Nigerian institutions do their business. We don't work, we are not working in competition to the banks. That's why I people correct you that we are not a neo bank, yeah. right? We are more or less like an extension for banks. We have aggregated so many banks and we are now their agent for going into digital platforms where they are unable to reach. Aggregate data at the point of transaction. Very powerful. I'm not asking you to send me things. I'm going to where you live, where you transact, and I'm getting that data real time. And I'm going to tell them that, look, it's happening over here. This small business who you naturally will not be able to qualify is making two million naira a week. Your threshold allows you to be able to give this guy a million naira a week. I'm also guaranteeing you that this platform that he's, he's uh, plugged into is stable and is going to pay him two million in another one week, which I'm able to collect for you. I give you all that, and within 24 hours, you're able to make a decision. You're able to disburse the money directly to that guy, right? So we are now placing ourselves as an integral part of how established Nigerian businesses do business. So we are very much a fabric of, of this. So if you see us listen in Nigeria Stock Exchange very soon, who knows? <laughs> you know, but I mean, we do have foreign investors, so I think I need to mention that. It's so, so good to have conversations um, with people like you, Chikodi Ukari, um, founder of Salad Africa. It's been a great conversation, ladies and gentlemen. It's been so, so good on the business hour on this episode. Catch up with us, same time, same station, next week, where we have the conversations on money, business, and economy. Make sure you stay profitable. Yeah.